Okay, so with regard to negative gearing, there's a lot of changes to come and everyone's talking about it. What I want to talk about in this little clip, very briefly, is how you should brace yourself for the changes. Okay, there's a couple of very important little things you can do, but sometimes the way you tweak things in finance can make an enormous difference in the long run. Let's start with what negative gearing is. I think we all have a pretty much understanding of it. When you have a net rental loss, so you earn your rental income from an investment property, take away the agent's fees, the depreciation, uh, any repairs you might conduct, and the big one being the interest that you pay on the loan with regard to that investment property, you get to claim against your uh, personal income which is fantastic. So if you make a $10,000 loss and you're on a 37% tax bracket, you'll get about 3,000 back at tax time. That's fantastic. But let me talk a little bit about negative gearing and what's going to happen. The Labor government are pretty much saying that they're going to can negative gearing. They're not going to allow that to happen. The main reason they want to do this is, well, at the moment, first home buyers are getting outbid by investors. Investors are going to an auction and looking at a tax deduction. First home buyers are going to an auction looking for a home to bring up their family. Family, and the fact is that some first home buyers are being priced out of the market. We must remember that when these discussions started, the property market was kind of booming, so things are a little bit different now and it might not make so much sense. The other thing is that Labor government wants to recoup the $4 billion in lost tax revenue that us property investors get back from tax. But proponents of negative gearing argue that it, it, it supports our whole property market because us investors want to buy properties, developers build properties, and because of that, people who want to rent properties get cheaper rents. So look, anyway, this clip is about what I want you to do as a property investor or potential property investor. This whole strategy is based on the fact that existing investment properties that you already hold will not be affected by any changes. The Labor government has made it quite clear that if you already have a negatively geared investment property, you will continue to be able to claim the net loss from those investments against your personal income. That's the first thing. The next thing I want to say about negative gearing, because I don't believe it's going to be so much doom and gloom, is that first of all, negative gearing is fairly weak. Now what I mean by that is that, let's say you have $1 million property property that rents for $800 per week. So that's about $42,000. If the full amount on the amount borrowed of one million and forty thousand, because of course you would borrow the full amount plus a stamp duty, the interest is about for 47,000. So based on that, the net rental property loss is only 5,000 per annum. Now hold on, we've got to take into account agents fees and let's assume there's some depreciation in that factor. So let's add a whole another $10,000. So the loss is $15,000. So your net rental property loss of $15,000 is not that great in the scheme of things. Sure, you'll get about $5,000 back at tax time, but it's not the end of the world. So my point is that these days, negatively gearing is not that much of a big benefit. Let me go back 10 or 12 years, and the reason is back then, interest rates were closer to 8%. So if you borrowed a million and 40,000, the loss from owning that same investment property, because rents are about the same, is $93,000. The cash you'd get back at tax saving is $34,000. So you see, negatively geared properties was a, gave people a huge advantage 10, 12 years ago. Um, I know I was working in the bank and I was geared up to my ears and I pretty much got all my tax back. At the moment, it's $5,000 you only gain a $5,000 cash benefit from negatively gearing a $1 million property. It's not that much. The next thing I'd like to say is that negative gearing doesn't last very long. Um, if you bought that property, let's go back to that example 10, 12 years ago, that property now would be worth over $2 million, the rent would be about $1,400, and you would still be only owing $1 million and 40000 to the bank. Let's assume, I mean, you, you can only ever owe against an investment property the acquisition costs. My point is, they would be, you would be far positively geared now. Negative gearing only lasts eight, 10 years. I'll put that in a very simple way. My parents purchased their house for $39,000 in 1973. If they had serviced this loan on an interest-only basis for the last 50 years, they still only owe $37,000 on that property, even though it's worth $2 million. So my point is that even if you're only paying interest-only, you are covering 
the inflation along the way. That's why negative gearing doesn't last a long time. It's an interesting thing that a lot of people, when they've bought an investment property the last five years, automatically put it in the name, let's say it's a married couple, put it in the name of the highest income earner. Well, this is where it gets really tricky because you've got to remember in eight years that property is positively geared and it probably doesn't work out the way you intended it to. And for those of you who buy properties in discretionary trusts and property trusts to get around that, where they can allocate the funds, yeah, you've been cleverly advised, well done. But another thing about the Labor Party is that that is on the cards to be axed as well. So once a property becomes very positively geared, this is one of the reasons, one of the few reasons why I recommend people sell investment properties, and that is to liquidate them in order to recycle your debt into good debt. So if you're still carrying non-deductible debt, if you still carry a home loan, there's nothing wrong with buy, selling an investment property, getting rid of that positively geared property. As crazy as it sounds, even if you then go and acquire the property next door, sure there's sales costs and stamp duty costs, but you would be able to use the sales proceeds to extinguish your non-deductible debt and then get a whole lot of brand new good debt. Here's the crux of this video of what I want people to think about. Let's say you have a home and you have a loan, loan A. Let's say you've paid out your home. So you have loan A, but loan A is fully an offset account. You do that just in case your home becomes an investment property one day. Fantastic. And let's say you have an investment property across the road and you have another loan against that investment property, loan B. That's your tax deductible loan. What are you doing with your surplus cash? Are you reducing the, the balance of loan B because you've got nowhere else to put your cash? Your home loan's repaid, you might as well pay off your investment loan. This is my point. I would prefer that you had an investment offset account against loan B. The way that you reduce the effective amount that you owe on loan B is to pile up the offset account rather than squash down the loan. And I'll tell you why, because that investment property with loan B is always going to be negatively geared. Let's jump ahead. You buy a property in two years time once we've had the changes to our legislation. If you get a, a investment property C and you get loan C, so what you would do is pick up the investment funds that you have in loan against loan B and shift that to be in the offset account against loan C. That's because you're increasing your net rental loss in loan B where you get to negatively gear your loss and you reduce your net rental loss against loan C which you will no longer be able to negatively gear. So guys I'm always rambling about the short term benefit of offset accounts, the lifestyle benefits, particularly why most of my clients have dual offset arrangements against their home loan. But don't discount the long term benefit particularly now when the rules are about to change with those of you with existing negatively geared properties, don't repay the loans. Close the effective balance by filling up your offset account because offset accounts are transferable, right? So I'm in the position now if I bought a property next year, it would not be negatively geared anyway. Another thing why the whole thing is not doom and gloom, and I'm sorry guys, but there's a lot of wealthy people in Australia who don't need to actually borrow money when they buy investment properties. So trust me, there's a lot of wealthy people that when these rules come out, and I expect the market to have a little shock, um, once people think, oh wow, investment investors are going to be out of the market now, but they will be swooping in and supporting the price of these properties in some manner. So another thing, a lot of people are wondering, should I acquire a property now before the rules change? Yeah, well, um, this was something that we actually anticipated and were a bit scared that would be an artificial mini boom before Labor got elected. Given the state of the property markets right now, that hasn't happened and I don't expect it to happen. Um, so we've got away with that one. So moving forward, is investment property viable? Yes, of course it is, but I want people to be a whole lot smarter. Um, one video I'm rolling out is a whole bunch of properties that I've bought in the last six years, and you just gotta be smart about it. You've gotta understand whose name to put it in. You've gotta understand unit trusts, discretionary trusts. For those of you who have the capacity to use self-managed super fund to assist, you just have to. It's the biggest tax haven and asset protection shelter you're ever going to get, and it is on the cards to be removed as well. All I can do is offer advice with regard to current legislation. It's a funny time now where legislation is changing and I'm having to look ahead. A lot of my time is actually helping our existing clients. The days five years ago when I was just in acquisition mode is a little bit different now. I've got over a thousand clients who need my personal advice. So guys, if you think this has been useful, please share this video around to your friends. Gee, if they just understand, don't pay off your investment loans, reduce the amount you owe on investment loans by opening up a second offset. Just takes a phone call. Really simple stuff and will make the world of difference to whether 
it's actually viable for you to buy an investment property in the future. Thanks so much for watching. Keep cool.